guys hear me? Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Love this morning, just being together, worshipping, it's been awesome. Okay, well, we are actually concluding our series Builders with God today, and if you haven't been with us over the last few months, we've been working through the book of Nehemiah, which is found in the Old Testament, a great man of God, and uh, for those that don't know who he was, Nehemiah was a Jew uh, that lived actually in a foreign land, so he wasn't living in his home nation, or a, and um, he actually worked as a servant in a, in a palace in Babylon, and uh, one day God came to him and spoke to him and challenged him challenged him to leave the comfort of this palace that he was in and to undertake a great work, a great work of restoration. At the time, the city of Jerusalem lay in ruins. The walls of the city were in ruins and had been in disrepair for 140 years. God called Nehemiah to come back to the city of Jerusalem and to repair and restore these broken walls. It seemed like an impossible task, but Nehemiah rallied God's people together. He called each and every person to play their part. And although he experienced huge challenge and opposition along the way, in only 52 days, the wall was rebuilt. The wall was rebuilt and the city was restored, but more than that, a people had been reformed. A people had been brought back to God and to God's ways. It's a truly remarkable story. And it's one which we've been using as a church community to stir our faith in God. And also stir us to be in a place where we are also all involved in active engagement and participation in God's mission here at TVZ Church. And if you haven't been along for a uh, a while TVC Church is all about restoration. It's all about bringing restoration across Teesside and beyond with the love and kindness of God. Well, we are going to finish this series. We're going to uh, cover a lot of scripture together, the last two chapters in Nehemiah. Um, I will summarize a lot of it because we don't have time to go through, but we're going to look together. What are the key themes that we can pick out and learn from? Uh, our title this morning is Builders with God, the foundation of dedication. The foundation of dedication, that's where we're going. Just to set the context, as I've already kind of said, after um, 140 years, the walls, the ruins, uh, the walls were in ruins, the city was in ruins, the people far away from God. Nehemiah comes back, and in only 52 days, the wall, the city, the people have been restored, and it's time to celebrate. It's time to celebrate. Let's put up the big scripture reading that we've got. I'm not going to read through it, um, but what I've done is I've highlighted some different words and underlined some different words just to help us understand what's going on here. Um, It says, At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and they were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate, celebrate joyfully with dedication with songs of thanksgiving, with the music of cymbals, with harp and lyres. And then other words I've highlighted, the musicians, the priests and the Levites. There was large choirs to give thanks. There was musical instruments. There was a first choir sent to this part of the city. There was a second choir sent to another part of the city and the choirs sang. And it says that on that day, they offered great sacrifices rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. God's people joined together to celebrate what he had done. This amazing miracle of the walls and city being restored. And it was time to dedicate this moment to this moment to God, to give God the glory. It was a massive party. The city was bouncing. People could be heard far and wide of the rejoicing. It was a massive occasion, a mountaintop moment for the whole community of God's people, a great party. And it got me thinking, what are the equivalents that we might experience? And it got my attention. I've been watching this series about Second World War. And um, 
World War II lasted for six long, arduous years, and on September the 2nd, 1945, the war was finally over, and VE Day happened. Victory in Europe. Was anybody alive during that time? Put your hand up. Amazing. Do you know what? We owe so much to this generation in the room that gave up so much. Why don't we just give them some appreciation? <laughs> On 2nd of September 1945, it was a time of celebration. The streets, the cities were filled with people. There was rejoicing, there was the singing. Here's a picture of one of the cities. I mean, it was all happening. Joy, fun, laughter, dancing, singing. The churches were filled with services of thanksgiving, with prayers of thanksgiving to God, songs of thanksgiving to God. And this is what it was like for Nehemiah and God's people at this time. It was massive. Like the whole city was absolutely buzzing because what God had done. And it was time to celebrate. It was time to give God thanks. And it was time to worship him. Time to worship him. The first point that I want to share with us on dedication that we see here, first of all, is that a life of dedication makes worship central. Now, it was interesting. I wasn't meant to be speaking today. But it's just so happened that the time when we're meant to be talking about worship, it's landed on me. So maybe God had something to do with that. For those that don't know, I do like uh, worship just a little bit. And um, I think that this passage shows us that worship needs to become central for, for if we're going to be a people that's dedicated. The passage in Nehemiah shows us that God's people gathered and they, uh, they retell the story. They retell the story of what God has done, of who God is, of his love, of his kindness, of his faithfulness. And it's time to thank him. It's time to praise him. It's time to worship him. It's time to give him the glory as they dedicate the wall. Nehemiah basically went out right across the region. He found musicians and priests and singers and choirs and Levites. And he said, guys, I want you to come. I want you to come and I want you to lead us because it's time to give God the glory and they ended up gathering to worship to lift God high and they started to appoint and employ people that would help in worship and worship became a rhythm in this community it became a rhythm it became a way of life that worship became central in 1646 a group of leaders from the church of England met together to help bring definition to Christian teaching and practice. Most people couldn't read and write in those times, but they wanted to help clarify um, Christian teaching and practice. And the Westminster Short Catechism was formed. Many of you will have heard of this before, but the key statement from it is this. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You know, throughout history, across hundreds and thousands of years, worship has always been central for God's people. Whatever century, whatever generation, whatever culture, whatever background, wherever you found a people that are dedicated to God, you will see that worship is central. People understood that we're here to live for the glory of God. At the end of time, when we pass from this life to the next, the book of Revelation tells us that we will all join together with a great multitude of people, people from every generation, from every nation, from every tribe, from every tongue, from every background. And we'll turn to the person next to us and we'll say, I don't deserve to be here. And they'll turn around and go, I don't deserve to be here either. And then suddenly we'll look up and everybody will be gathered around. We'll look up and we'll see a king seated on a throne and we'll see a lamb that looks like it's been slain. And it will be a glorious, holy, overwhelming moment as we're caught with the holiness and the glorious nature of who God is. And it says that we'll join together in song. We'll join together in song and cry out, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb. 
be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. It's going to be an awesome, awesome moment. I think it's really important for us to understand that when we gather together as God's people, that we need to be a people that make worship central. When we join together, we're to retell the story of who God is and what he's done. And we're in turn called to give him thanks, give him praise, give him glory, and give him honor. And as a church, it's something that we really value and prioritize. Martin's already mentioned we've got throne room tonight at 7.30, but... We're also, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a live album recording as Taken Ground Churches on the 5th of April. And we would love to invite you to come to that. The 5th of April. We've been singing some songs that we've written together, like Forever Worthy, Here and Now. And we're going to be recording them. And we want to capture the sound of the church singing these songs. We want to capture a moment that will inspire us and take us forward so that we become more and more a people that make worship central. So please do come along to that. It's going to be awesome. You know, if we are to be a people dedicated to God, we've got to understand that worship is far beyond just our singing and our songs, but it's more than that. It's the whole of our lives, the way in which we live each and every day for the glory of God. Romans 12 verse 1, a scripture from the New Testament a guy called Paul wrote it, and he said this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So as you live your life, may you die as an offering of worship to him. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Worship is the everyday moments in our lives, in our relationships, how we are with one another, in our workplace, and our workplaces with our work ethic in our if we're studying how are we applying ourselves in that in our communities and our families every moment are we seeking to bring God glory we're seeking to dedicate these things to him we're to follow in the footsteps of John the Baptist that said may he increase that I may decrease in the big things in the little things and there'll be times in our lives where we'll have to make decisions of whether we want to dedicate ourselves to God as an act of worship. And I think back to my own journey. I remember when I was uh, 18 years old and my dedication was all about football. All about football. Any football fans in the room? Anyone excited for the Euros? Going to be interesting. Will we win? Who knows? We'll pray. And um, when I was 18, football was my passion, my dedication. It was it ruled everything in my life, and I was trying to work out whether I was to pursue a career in football or whether God had something else for me, and opportunities and doors were opening up, but I felt God speak to me, and I was at a, um, a youth event out in America, in Alabama, in this little town, and it was one of those moments where God just comes to you and speaks to you, and I'm praying, God, what do you want me to do? I want to dedicate myself to you. What path do you want me to choose? And this woman came up to me, random person, I've never met her in my life, and she just started praying for me. And she said, I just feel like the Lord wants to say, it's time to lay down the pursuit of fame and pursue me. And I was like, oof, as God just hit me with that challenge. And in that moment, I knew that it was time for me to lay down football and to pursue him. And I ended up going to Bible college a few months later. Now, I'm not saying everybody would have to do that, but that for me was a moment where I had to make a decision and God called me to dedicate myself. Worship is ultimately saying that I want to submit to the rule of Jesus and the reign of Jesus in my life. He is both Savior and Lord. Yeah? Yeah? When we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we become more like him. How did Jesus end his life as he's coming to the reality of having to carry the cross, do something he doesn't really want to do? God, would you take this cup from me, but not my will be done, your will be done. The ultimate act of worship is surrendering. Many of you will know an amazing, amazing man that was a a much-loved family member of this church, Adrian Parker, and um, Adrian was a part of the worship team, so I got to know Adrian really, really well, an amazing man of God, and I remember a couple of weeks before he passed away, we were sat in James' 
James Cook Hospital and we were talking together and he was a man of faith. He was a man of faith and he was telling me about all the things he was looking forward to doing, the place he was looking to go to, the things he was wanting to do. He was in faith that God would heal him. But as we came to the end of our time and we sat down and we prayed together, it's one of the most special moments of true surrender as right at the end, he just let out a real cry. He said, God, but not my will be done. Your will be done. As he dedicated himself to God in that moment. And two weeks, le- two weeks later, he passed from this life to the next. And he's now joining with the angels. With many people worshipping him. And Adrian taught me something really, really important. That worship is much, much more than just singing and playing music. But it's actually ultimately about our hearts. Are we willing to trust God and dedicate ourselves to him wholeheartedly? That's the first point. If we're to be a people dedicated, we're called to be those that make worship central. As we follow the story, as after some time, Nehemiah, after all the celebrations had happened, he had to go back to Babylon because he had a job working as a servant in the Persian palace. He went back there. And um, as you read through chapter 13, you start to, to see that God's people gradually started to drift ever so slightly away from God. Worshipping God became less important. Saying yes to God's ways became secondary. And God's people started to drift further and further away from God. Nehemiah ended up coming back to Jerusalem and seeing what had happened as God's people had started to desert God. We see this right throughout chapter 13. We're not going to read it all because it's a huge chunk of scripture, but we can put up on the screen just to summarize some of the key things that you read through that demonstrate God's people had sort of started to drift away from God. An Ammonite, so that wasn't one of God's people, a guy called Tobiah, had been allowed into the temple, something that God had instructed his people not to do. Not, Not just allowed to come in, but given a place to live. Giving and tithing started to get skimped on people, stopped being generous towards God and started holding on to things themselves. The Sabbath day, the day of rest, started to be dishonored and people just started to do their own thing and do what they wanted instead of honoring that. And godly marriage started to be despised within the community. A number of ways that demonstrate that God's people had drifted away from God. And when Nehemiah came back to Jerusalem, he said, guys, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. It's time to understand that a life lived for God is not just on the mountaintops, but it's in the everyday moments. And it's about seeking to choose him each and every day. He called God's people back to God and he called them to stay on track. If you want to be a people, if we want to be a people that are a people of dedication, we need to be those that stay on track, that stay on track. When I was uh, younger, I remember going to North Africa on a mission trip, and it was uh, one of those um, amazing experiences, and um, basically I was in a, a group, and we were tasked with traveling through the Atlas Mountains Uh, in about 40 degree heat and we were given a little map and it was not a modern map it was a map from the 1950s that basically had no roads on just donkey trails and so we had to get through the Atlas Mountains to reach out into these communities and off we set and we were following our map and we were staying on track and then we started to look ahead and we thought hang on a minute the path's going this way but if we go this way we're going to save loads of time. So we went off track and off we went and we thought we were making good progress and then suddenly we just got lost. We got lost in the middle of these Atlas Mountains, in the middle of nowhere, and we started to panic. And so we thought, right, let's go this way. And so we went that way. That didn't get us anywhere. We went this way and we got lost right in the valley and where there was water. And looking back, we took a few risks that you think, gosh, Some people could have seriously got hurt. Anyway, we got lost because we didn't stay on track. And we had to sleep out on the mountains. Like, we slept like that, just lying on the mountain like that. 
and we woke up in the middle of the night, it was freezing. In the next morning, we set off, and we eventually found this donkey trail, and we got on the track, and we got to the village, and it was, it was all right in the end, and the villagers said, how did you get here? And we said, oh, we came along this track. They were like, oh, you know, there's a road, like 200 feet up there. And they said, do you know that people die on that track you've just been on? And we were like, what? Anyway, we got there. But the point was, we didn't get there in good time and we got lost because we didn't stay on track. If we're going to be God's people that are those that are dedicated, we need to be those that stay on track. Paul puts it like this in the New Testament. He says, um, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Dedication is not solely about the decisions we make on the mountaintops, but dedication is committing ourselves each day to live for God by giving our all, being wholehearted, running the race, staying on track that God has marked out for us. God is not meant to just simply be an add-on to our lives, but one that we build our lives around. Think of somebody in your mind, somebody that's dedicated. Might be an athlete, might be someone with a certain profession. Think about that person. Think about the way that they live their lives. Their lifestyle revolves around the thing that they're dedicated to. Their time, their energy revolves around their dedication. We think of people like William Wilberforce, who for 20 years with a group of Christians campaigned against the evil of slavery and had to fight against a huge wall of opposition for 20 years. After 20 years, slavery was abolished. How did that happen? It was because it took a man that had dedication, that stayed committed to the cause, that stayed on track, that didn't get sidetracked, but stayed on track. Athletes achieve dedication through staying on track, running their, their race, they persevere, they work hard in training. And Paul calls us to run the race, and Nehemiah called the people back to stay on track and to run the race that God had marked out for them. We're all to stay on track, and we've got to understand that this Christian life is not a sprint. It's not just a quick moment. It's not just following Jesus in these little moments, but it's about a marathon. It's about taking each and every step following Jesus. And maybe that can feel a little bit overwhelming at times. All we need to do is focus on the day in front of us and say, Jesus, would you help me to follow you today? God, would you help me to pursue you to you today? Has anyone done a marathon in the room? Anyone? Yes. Amazing. When I was 20 years old, I was really like into sport and I was like, I'm going to do a marathon. And I booked in to do a marathon. And after a few weeks, I got, basically, I just gave up. I was like, this is too hard. I got injured. And the problem was, is when you do a marathon, you have to run really, really slow in your training. So naturally, you just want to run really quick and keep going. But on a marathon, you have to be really disciplined in your training to run really slow and gradually build things up and build the mileage in your legs. And so when I was 20, I basically couldn't do it and gave up. And then last year, I was like, I can do this. I can do this. I've got a few more years' experience. Maybe I can do it. And last year, I did my first marathon. And uh, in fact, I did two last year. I know. And... um, (laughs) The, the only reason why I did it is because I stayed on track with the training plan. Because I stayed on track with the pl- training plan. I didn't get distracted by other things. Yes, my diet had to change. My lifestyle had to change. My priorities had to change. But I think at the moment in our society, you know, we live in a... You can, you can order things and get it the same day now, can't you? We live in a same-day delivery, instant messaging, quick-fix society... And sometimes we can allow this into our Christian journey, you know? Oh, I tried to read my Bible, but it didn't really work for me, so I don't read it anymore. I tried to come into church, but I don't really like the songs, so I don't come anymore. Yeah, we can treat our faith in the same way. But actually, what the Bible tells us is that we're to be those that run the race with perseverance, that put one foot in front of the other and keep 
going, yes, Jesus has saved us by his grace, but he has huge plans and purposes for each and every one of our lives. If we're going to fulfill those plans and purposes, we've got to be those that are going to seek him and going to pursue him and going to make him number one. I'm going to share with you a couple of things that I think can help us stay on track and be dedicated. Number one is have a rhythm of devotion. Have a rhythm of devotion. If you train for a marathon, you need a plan. You need a rhythm. You need a routine. When Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? You know, there's loads of commandments in the law. And Jesus was asked, what's the most important? What did he say? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. It starts with a love in our hearts. It starts with a love. This encompasses the whole of the law. And if we were to meet Nehemiah and spend time with him, we would understand that this was a man that loved God because he left the riches of this palace, a comfortable, easy life, to go and restore the city against huge opposition. He was a man that loved God. You know, for those that are married, if you want to endure in your marriage, you've got to, you understand that you've got to stay committed and dedicated. And how do you do that? You invest time together doing things that stir a love and a passion for one another. If you don't do that, it's going to be very, very difficult to stay dedicated. But we can do many, many things to help us have a rhythm of devotion for God. Things like having daily prayer, spending time with God in conversation, praying to him. Scripture memorization, thanksgiving journals, speaking in tongues, getting in God's creation, using things like Lectio, Word for Today, using worship music, reading the Word of God. I'm loving reading through Philippians um, at the moment. There's, there's just so much in there that can inspire you to keep going. But something I do every day is I read scriptures from Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 7 which is all about the throne room of God. All about the throne room of God as I remind myself of who God is in all of his magnificence and his glory. It stirs my heart again to love him, to give my life to him, to spend my life serving him. And we need to find the things that stir our hearts because it'll be different things for different ones of us. We'll do different things. Like last year, I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn scripture. I'm gonna get scripture to stir my heart. So every week last year, I learned a memory verse. Can't remember many of them. (laughs) But every week, I was being intentional about reminding myself and teaching myself, this is who God is. This is who God is. He's the God that's able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And when you do that every day and remind yourself of who God is, it motivates you to want to love him and stay dedicated to him. We need to make sure we're doing things that keep us passionate for God, keep us zealous for God. The second thing that can help us stay on track and keep us dedicated is this, having a healthy fear of God, having a healthy fear of God. This is something that we don't talk about a lot, but if you read throughout the Bible, it's something that's really talked about a huge deal. Now, when the Bible talks about this this fear of the Lord, it's not about a fear that makes us scared of God. But it's actually a fear that makes us want to come towards God. It's a fear that makes us want to come towards God. And it's a fear that we could put it in another way. When we stand before God and see the magnificence of God, we're going to stand in awe and reverence of who he is. In fact, many of you know the disciple John. He was Jesus' closest disciple. He leant on Jesus' shoulder He was so intimate and close with Jesus. But it says that when he went into the throne room, what did he do? He fell on his face before a holy God. A holy God. And Nehemiah was a man that had a holy fear of God. He knew who God was. And it was something that motivated him and helped him stay dedicated to God. There's three instances uh, in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1 verse 11, Nehemiah 5 9, and Nehemiah 5 15, which talk about how the fear of the Lord helped Nehemiah be a man that chose to stay dedicated to God, that chose to inspire the people around him to say, let's not get distracted by these things, but let's remember who God is. He is worthy. He is worthy of our attention, of our obedience. There was a study done 
um, recently where they were trying to work out the percentage of how many leaders across time have finished well in their journey of faith. And the study looked at all the leaders in Scripture right throughout the Bible from the Old to the New Testament. They looked at leaders right throughout church history and they looked at leaders in modern day times. And the outcome was that they found that only one in every three leaders finished well. One in every three leaders finished well. And they found that one of the common traits that were associated with those that were successful in finishing the race well were those that had a holy fear and reverence of who God was. Leaders like Joshua, leaders like Nehemiah, they feared the Lord and honored him. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus himself in Isaiah, Jesus himself treasured the fear of the Lord. Jesus, the Son of God, treasured the fear of the Lord. He delighted in it. He prioritized it. And we see that, don't we, when, he, when Jesus was asked, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And he said, I'm only doing what my Father tells me to do. I'm only doing what my Father wants me to do. There was this holy obedience that Jesus had towards the Father. Proverbs 16 verse 6 says this, Through the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. You know, when we teach our kids, we teach them to have healthy fear of certain things, don't we? Don't go near that cliff edge at Saltburn. Yeah? Don't, don't run out across the road. Look both ways before you cross the road. That's, that's a dog you can stroke. That dog, because you know it. But don't just go and stroke any dog. Yeah? If you go at the zoo, you want to be this side of the fence, not that side of the fence. <laughs> it's good to have a healthy fear. Because the fear of the Lord helps us avoid evil. If we have a holy awe of who God is, it'll help us stay on track. It'll help us in those moments where Satan comes and says, oh, it doesn't really matter. You can do this. And you go, no, this is who God is. This is who I'm living for. I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to choose God's way and I'm going to stay on track. If we're going to be a people that stay dedicated, we need to be those that keep worship central we need to be those that um, stay on track. We need rhythms of devotion, rhythms of dedication. You know, the Bible tells us that wherever we're at in our journey, whether we've got a relationship with God, whether we've been in relationship for many years, however we're feeling, the Bible tells us that when we turn to God, that he's like a father with open arms. He's like a dad with open arms that runs to us and he says, wow. I love you, and I want you to succeed so much. He's your biggest champion. He's your biggest supporter. He is championing you on in everything that you are facing at the moment, and he wants you to succeed. Did you know that God is dedicated to you this morning? Yeah? He is 100% dedicated to you succeeding and achieving. Philippians 1 verse 6 says this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God is 100% dedicated and committed to you. The walls of Jerusalem, the city and the people of God were restored because Nehemiah and God's people were those that were dedicated. Even when they got it wrong, God still wanted them back and still was faithful to them. Church, I want to encourage us, let's be a people that history looks back on and goes, oh, wow, wow. That was a people that was dedicated to God. Wow, that time in Tisoyad, God brought about a great work of transformation, of restoration. Why? Because there was a people that were dedicated Amen. to God. You know, many times we can feel like we're in ruins. We go through different things in life. We get hit by tsunamis out of nowhere. Or maybe we just gradually drift away from God. I was reminded of a song lyric um, by a song called Foundations, it says this, when I feel like ruins, you see foundations. You see foundations to build your kingdom here. However we're feeling this morning, God is committed to doing something truly remarkable in us and through us. I'm going to invite the band just to come up. We're going to sing a song in just a moment. You 
know, maybe we're here today and maybe we're feeling like, actually, do you know what? I want to commit again. I want to dedicate myself again. There's going to be an opportunity to do that. Maybe we've never committed. That opportunity for you to commit is there. Maybe you're sat there going, do you know what? I'm just feeling a bit worn out, feeling like ruins. But I know that the answer's not found in here. It's found in here. In him and through him. We're going to be giving an opportunity to respond this morning. Just while we're reflecting on what we've been looking at, I'm going to, uh, we're going to watch a short little video, a spoken word, which Stella Spence has created. And we're going to use this spoken word just to reflect because I think it encapsulates well the spirit that we could have as we respond to God this morning. And then we're going to sing a song together. So if we could watch the video, that would be great. I am weak. I am hungry. I fear greatness more than failure. My cracks are many. Come close and you will see through them into my soul. I pray you find the king of glory as you look past the material I am made of. The rise and swell of the tide of his holy presence is growing within me. I can hold you back no more, my Lord and Saviour. May the tsunami of your presence take me and those who are leaning in with their hunger on display. Wreck us, Holy Spirit, not me, us. We are your church. We move at pace in the torrent of your power and presence. It's time. It's the tipping point. No turning back. It's a one-way road. The force of heaven at our backs. There is no opting out of this pension scheme. Decisions made in the waters of baptism. Oh yes, greatness frightens me more than failure. Because when the great and awesome God of glory, the holy, holy, holy one speaks through this material flesh, it terrifies me. If I speak on behalf of him, I better not be a snowflake or a gold digger, because the time is now. He is here at the door. The lion, the lamb, the lover of your heart, the awesome king of glory. He is the one who's reaching his hand through the lattice of our hearts and lifting the latch. His fragrance is permeating the air. He is a passionate lover, constant and true. He did rend the heavens and come down. He never left. Lean in and experience his fragrance. Let us lean in together. It's time, church. The time is now.
just sense this morning as as Matt was speaking, I do feel the Holy Spirit will have been speaking to many of us. Particularly in the whole arena of coming off track. And maybe this morning as as Matt shared that, maybe there's some way or just some, a particular area of your life where you think, hey, I, I'm off track. You may be here this morning, you may think, actually, I haven't got the rhythms of devotion to God that come out of a dedicated heart. And this morning you want to say, Lord, I, I want to make you my first love and first priority and get those rhythms of dedication back in. So if there's any way, any area you've come off track, or if there's any thing in your heart that wants to establish those dedications of rhythm better then I just want you this morning I want to say to you hey now's the time now's the time to combine that hearing of the word this morning with faith by stepping forward coming forward and just dedicating yourself afresh to get back on track dedicating yourself afresh to putting him at the center of your priorities and your rhythms of life so as we sing this through, I just want to encourage you. God's spoken. Take action. Combine with faith. And the Holy Spirit will meet you in this place this morning.